great morning. Thank awesome. You. Awesome, Doug. Thank you. And I'll just do one quick uh, housekeeping note. So, uh, the purpose of Lessons in Leadership is, frankly, for us to have uh, a good and candid and open discussion with leaders in the region and not outside of the region uh, about you know, their journey and maybe help each one of us in our journey. So, this is all off the air. Um, so we'll give uh, ourselves that space to be able to, uh, to have big conversations. So, Matt, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, uh, I just mentioned to you, I, I learned that you're from St. Louis. I spent some time in St. Louis. Um, and I know that uh, your dad here. Um, you ever seen another one out there? Go Blues. <laughs> so, uh, so, I learned I learned a bit about you in, in preparing for this. Your, your dad was a doctor, and that you and your family at that time were Lots of road trips. Um, and no road trips taught you something. What did you show the roots of the road trips that taught you that you bring forward to the Um Yeah, uh, we, we did. We, we would pile into a van. My, my parents both um, you know, grew up with uh, very little in the way of resources. And my mother's family never traveled at all. And so she had all this pent up desire to travel. So anytime we had a free day of any kind, we'd pile into a car and drive somewhere. My dad was born in Ireland, and he read as a child voraciously about America and all the different parts of the country and wanted to go see them all. And so by the time I went to college, I'd been to all 48 of the lower 48 states because we would just get into a van and drive everywhere. And uh, one thing I learned is that uh, shit rolls downhill. <laughs> because I'm the youngest. <laughs> I, would, I would get the shittiest uh, spot in the car. And it was, a, it was a van, it was one of these you know, long Chevy vans, and there were two bench seats in the back. And my sisters each got a full bench seat. And then I got two cushions off of our couch that were put on the floor. Which is, you know, I'm pretty sure there are no airbags down there. <laughs> and, you know, I was on the floor. And every now and then, you know, if I was napping or something, I might wake up to the feeling of cookie crumbs you know, <laughs> sprinkled on my face. And my sisters would, would, would love doing that kind of thing. Um, but, I, you know, I also, I mean, one of the things that um, my wife and I, you know, try to practice with our own kids, you know, I, I, I thought these were the greatest trips on earth. And you know there was there was nothing luxurious about any of it. You know we were you know eating in you know highway restaurants and staying in motel sixes and sometimes sleeping in the van. And it wasn't you know this, this, I, I didn't know the difference between that and, and nice accommodations. I didn't care. You know I was with my family and we played games and it was fun. And so um, you know my wife and I try to try to carry that forward by. Not spoiling our own kids, but also not making too much out of you know the, the, the venue or the accommodations running up, but actually just the time, having time together yeah. matters a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And along on the journey, you you came across a name I think that has a lot of meaning for you, Mabel Hancock. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit about the Mabel Hancock's imprint on your name? Yeah, so um, this is one of these stories that uh, you know, took on legendary proportions as I was growing up. But so I, I mentioned my father was born in Ireland, and um, he, uh, he he was you know born on a farm uh, in a town called Dunmore, which is about maybe half an hour outside of Galway in the west of Ireland. And uh, his father and his mother were school teachers in the town. And they taught together in a one-room schoolhouse, which sounds like a total nightmare as a child. <laughs> Having both your parents be your teachers in one room with your eight other siblings, which just sounds, uh, sounds like a nightmare for parents also. <clears throat> but anyway, um, there was a, the, the uh, history in my family is, is that uh, my dad's dad, the, the only reason he learned how to read or became a school teacher and later became a college professor is because he was taught <clears throat> how to read by the uh, daughter of the English landlord on whose estate they were farmers. Uh, her name was Mabel Hancock. And 
she was, uh, you know, good 15, 15 years older than he was, but she, she was still young and um, in school herself. And so she was kind of practicing, um, you know, her, her uh, didactic instincts, her, her desire to teach by teaching this young boy who she thought seemed smart and promising. Um, but they would have to do it uh, in secret because his father was so anti-English that if he caught him with uh, any of these English books that she was using, he would beat him and he would throw in the book. Uh, and he, he, his father was not literate. Um, but they would undertake their lessons, in, you know, un under, you know, in, 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 the, in the barn by candlelight at, at night or uh, you know, somewhere on the farm where they, you know, wouldn't be, he wouldn't, he wouldn't get caught, you know, reading English, um, English books. And so uh, the revolution came not long thereafter, and her family uh, fled Ireland, and uh, the, the, the estate, you know, was, was burned in the revolution, and, and the, you know, all the Irish tenant farmers took over, uh, you know, their land, took ownership of it, and she never returned to Ireland. Um, she came to the United States and she settled in Wyoming, in a town called uh, Sundance, Wyoming. And uh, so at one of our road trips as a kid was to go and try to do a little bit of homework on that story and see if we could find uh, her grave, because my, my father knew that she had since passed away. Uh, and she and, and his father, her student, both passed away within about a year of each other. Um, and they maintained correspondence. Uh, you know, letters, and she would send money back so that he could tend to the graves of her family, some of whom had died in the revolution. And, um, and so we went to this little cemetery called the Green Mountain Cemetery, which makes it sound like it's in Vermont, but it's in Wyoming. Um, and, uh, you know, we found her gravestone. And it, you know, it was a really cool kind of family <laughs> pilgrimage to go there. So my wife and I named our first child uh, Hancock, is his, birth, is his full name, we call him Hank. Um, but it's a, it, it's a story, I think, for me that kind of shows you the power of, you know, just doing something, you know, kind for somebody else, even if it's on a small scale, if it's just you and one other person, it can have a really big impact on somebody else's life. And huge, huge impact, obviously. I wouldn't be here if she hadn't done that. My dad, was, my dad became a doctor, you know, great in the United States. He wouldn't, that, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, and, you know, we, when we go back, and I'm actually headed back in two weeks, uh, to Ireland, we'll go back to that small town, and we'll run into people who are, you know, uh, you know, much much older, 80s, 90s, who will talk about my grandfather because he was apparently such a such a loved teacher in the town. And he taught everybody. I mean, he did, all the kids in the town came through their schoolhouse, um, and uh, we'll bump into people. We'll tell stories about him. Some of them are, are still alive and still around. So it's pretty. It's, it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty cool story, and um, it's one that, you know, we figured what, what better way to carry that forward than to actually name one of our kids after, after her. Wow. So, so, lots of road trips, still in Los Angeles, um, a lot more business, um, and then went on Dartmouth, where you drove for UPS. So, entrepreneurial sort of bent, at least your dad was probably a bit of an entrepreneur, pretty important in the way that you think about your leadership of the world? Yeah, actually, you know, my, my dad is one of these, he's, he's probably better described at the time as more like an Irish socialist who just didn't care about money or didn't, didn't really care about uh, things or anything like that, and uh, he's still that way. Um, my mom was really much more uh, about, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and kind of, you know, pulling yourself up and, and trying to make a better life. Um, and it, it was really, in, in her family, she, she's from Indiana originally, born in Ohio, but grew up in Indiana. She had a bunch of entrepreneurs and small business owners in the family. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff was really just out of necessity. You know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't really uh, love mowing lawns or edging people's yards or weeding their gardens or, you know, um, standing on the, you know, not a step part of a ladder to clean out their gutters, but um, that was, you know, that was the only way to make any money. Um, and so that's really what drove it. And then UPS was, you know, was, uh, I, I interviewed for the job like a week after my 21st birthday, 
it was the highest paying job on a you know hourly rate uh, basis that I could get, but you could only get it, you could only drive a PBS truck, you're 21 years old. Um, somehow they figured something out a little different from the car rental company. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why uh, they were willing to do that. It seemed like an unnecessary risk, but um, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, somehow I got that job, and you know they asked me three interview questions. You know, are, are you are you alive? <laughs> Twenty one. Uh, you know, can you see? Um, and, so yeah, so, so that uh, UBS job was, actually it was interesting. I thought very little of that job. I thought, well, this is, this is just a, it's a source of income, right? This, this is a, just a, a job, like all kinds of other jobs, but it wasn't uh, you know, what I was gonna do long term. And I certainly didn't think it had any real applicability to my employability after college. But what, what shocked me was that you know, I, I debated, should I, should I put that on my resume? If I take it off the resume, the resume looked a little light. So maybe I'll put it on, because I didn't have that much experience. And so I put it on, it was just two lines, you know, package truck driver, Earth City, Missouri. And um, so, like, anybody here know where Earth City, Missouri is? <laughs> so I, uh, I, I did that. And I found that in every, I interviewed with all these Wall Street banks, in every interview, nobody cared about my Price Waterhouse Cooper's internship in Florida or this or that. Uh, only thing they wanted to know about was the UBS job. You know, what was that like? Did you get to keep the brown uniform? <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you, you don't. They actually withhold your last paycheck until you return the brown uniform. <laughs> And this is back before you could find anything you want, you know, on Amazon. You can it on Amazon if you want it. But uh, I really wanted to keep that thing because I thought this will be, you know, Halloween costume in the next five or ten years. If I take care of it, but I did not get to, did not get to hang out. But I did one of the things I, that I really uh, took away from that was all. So, so the first couple of weeks on the job, you shadow another driver, and all these other drivers. Uh, none of them had college educations, but they were all incredibly driven, motivated, organized, high energy type A people. They're the type A, the, the types of people that if, if they had been given the opportunity to go to college somewhere, you know, they would, they would have much bigger jobs. And um, I was, you know, I hadn't been exposed to too many people like that before in that kind of context. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting kind of eye opener. <laughs> for me to spend that much time uh, with people like that. My nickname there was College. Uh, they just called me College, uh, which was also you know, an indication of kind of, you know, that this was very much a group that was, uh, you know, had, had great jobs for their education level, but was trying to, you know, make more for themselves and their family. Yeah, and, and saw that in you, so that's where we right. were headed. And that's what I think what they were all trying to, you know, see for their own kids, right. you know, they were kind of, you know, taking steps on that journey for themselves. So, so then Dartmouth to an analyst on Wall Street, I think, and then, uh, and then what many may not know is that you then founded a software company somewhere along the way. Co-founded, yeah. Co-founded, yeah. Yeah, well, it wasn't my idea originally, but um, I was, so, so yeah, I was working in uh, Boston at a uh, private equity firm, and, you know, the first four, years of my working life, I basically went from periods of feeling like I was just figuring out what I was doing to having no idea what I was doing. And, you know, almost being in a panic because I had just been given some new assignment that was beyond my skills and, you know, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Um, who, you know, who can I go ask to, to help me figure out how to do this? Um, which I now realize is, I think, normal, but at the time I thought I was the only one. Everybody else knew what they were doing, and I was the only one who didn't know what he was doing. Um, but uh, the, so, so when I was working at, it, it's a firm called the Thomas Lee Company, THL Co. It's a private equity firm in Boston. And um, I was working for an associate, so I was an analyst at, at, at the bottom. I was an analyst at Goldman Sachs, you know, crunching numbers, making pitch books. And then I went to uh, THL, Thomas Lee, and you know, same kind of role. Much smaller company though, maybe 25 people at the time. 
And uh, I was working for an associate who um, was uh, incredibly gifted and a, a really um, thoughtful mentor. Uh, you know, he was the kind of person who would we, we'd go through, uh, you know, a, a, a mock negotiation of a document, legal document that we were trying to negotiate with a company that, you know, we were trying to, to uh, make a deal with. And, and then uh, he would kind of run through a mock version of that with me, and then he would let me run the negotiation after one practice run, which a lot of people didn't bother to take the time to do that, but I learned a ton doing that sort of thing. Um, so he, he was married to a woman whose family owned radio stations, and she had come up with this idea of trying to use a graphical user interface to um, better connect ad agencies and media outlets, TV stations, radio stations, for purposes of selling advertising. Um, and I had worked with her husband on the acquisition of a software business that served, uh, basically did the back end systems for TV stations. Yeah. And so her idea, our experience, the three of us spent a lot of time working together on, you know, how could we take what is 30, 40 year old uh, computer code and essentially add, build a product that would sit on top of it and make it, make it work better? And um, so she and I spent a lot of time working through this idea. Um, I, I helped her write a business plan for it. And, um, and we started soliciting people for money, you know, trying to hold meetings to go raise money around this thing. And I was doing it on the side while I had another job. And so I was working basically seven days a week at nights, you know, and I had zero free time, um, such that when my day job ended, uh, I was so thankful to only have one job. Um, and <clears throat> we then uh, soon thereafter launched this, this company called ODAC, which is, you know, stood for Online Digital Advertising Connection. But, um, and ODAC for the next two years was, you know, kind of, you know, bouncing from one, um, you know, Hail Mary pass to the next of trying to sign up big accounts to beta test our software. In the end, we sold ODAC to a company called Encoda Systems uh, that then folded it in, which was kind of what we hoped for as a strategy anyway. Um, but it was a, it was a two year, very exciting ride. And one of the things that it taught me was that I, I, I really, um, I really loved doing something that was more entrepreneurial and had more of a, um, the, 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 where the outcomes were more determined by my efforts and you know, as opposed to just being you know, one of um, you know, hundreds or thousands of people kind of in a larger organization. And, uh, but, but I didn't like the fact that you know, I wasn't a computer science major, I wasn't a software engineer. I really didn't, I really didn't know the product that I was selling intimately, you know, I, I hadn't built it myself. I couldn't tell you how to build it, um, and maybe I'm a control freak in that way. But I, that that I always felt too far removed from it, um, and so that's one of the things that attracted me to real estate is that you know each real estate deal is kind of like its own little business within a larger business. Each one, um, depending on what you're going to do with it, is is some form of entrepreneurial venture where you can do a lot to the asset to change the outcome. Um, and it was the kind of thing that, you know, a dumb guy like me could actually understand. It wasn't computer science, it was, you know, this bricks and mortar. Um, but uh, that, you know, that, that was something that, that I kind of came to through experience rather than, you know, having any kind of family history in it or anything else like that. So. And you mentioned in that story that you had someone who was sort of Working through negotiations and sort of give you, you know, give you the keys, right? So you talked about this notion that sometimes if there's a five or a ten year difference in age between a leader and a person that they're leading, sometimes there's this maybe I'll call it unhealthy competition. I'll put that word right. out. Versus if, if you've got someone sort of in later years, um, it's like look, take this load off. Sounds like that was more of a take this load off kind of relationship. But you're pretty young guy, so I'm guessing how do you? manage that tension, if you will. Yeah. No, I think that's a real um, issue because, uh, and, and it's not just age, I mean, a lot of it is personality and approach. 
But one of the things that I noticed right away when I, I moved to Washington in 2004 to work at JVG, and I would go to these events where uh, you know it would be me and a couple of other people in their 30s, and uh, a, you know very few people in their uh, 40s, 50s, a lot of people in their 60s, and you know I, I always wondered what's going on. Where are, where where is everybody? Where are all them? And when you sort of line up what what happened in the economy, you had a ton of people basically just blow out of the real estate industry in you know, the late 80s, early 90s, and, and then the dot-com boom of the late 90s into the you know, early 2000s, um, they, they, never, they didn't come back. They didn't start coming back until the mid-2000s. Yeah. And so you had this whole you know, generation of, of talent basically get cleared out and, and not return. And, and a lot of the older generation had to almost hang on even longer to deal with succession and grooming and all the other stuff. So it was very fortunate, just lucky timing for someone like me because I was coming in to an organization that had a lot of older people who had, for the most part, uh, you know, already kind of made, you know, they, they, they earned what they wanted to earn through their, through their work. Uh, they, were, they, they enjoyed it, but they wanted to do less of it. And they were willing, as a result of that, to to share, you know, the, the economics, to hand off responsibility. They didn't want they didn't want the responsibility anymore. They want somebody else to do it. Ideally, they'd love to keep all the economics and have somebody else. Do it. <laughs> and and that, and some places try that, and you see what happens. You know, those are the places that have generation after generation of the up and comers, you know, rise up and leave and rise up and leave. Um, and JBG was always different because JBG, you know, shared everything and made opportunities like that. Um, and I think, you know, to your question about now, okay, so now I'm, you know, relatively younger, how do I deal with that? One of the things that, you know, we've always tried to do is, is to really give people lots of responsibility and to, and to always make sure that we have growth opportunities for them, which is, that, that, that's not always easy when you compare, you know, when you, when you line your business up with the backdrop of the cyclical industry that you're in, because sometimes uh, you don't necessarily want to be growing um, at, at, at today's market cost. You, you may, you may the, the cost of growth may be that you're investing heavily in very low returning opportunities, and so you might be better off investing a little bit less while you wait for the next point of cycle where you can invest a lot more. So it, it, it doesn't really, lend itself well to people that are looking for, you know, something big every six months, uh, like you might see in a software business or something like that. Um, but the thing that we try to do, that I try to do as, a, as, you know, the captain of the ship is to really stay out of people's way. And uh, if, if you have really good people in, in their roles and you don't micromanage them or second guess them, there, there are a lot of times where I disagree with the members on my team who are doing things, but I'll say, look, it's your, you know, this, this is your area, so you, you go execute. And, and a lot of times it'll have to do with personnel. You know, somebody will say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, I had an experience with so-and-so and, you know, I'm sort of not so sure about their judgment or not so sure, you know, they're up to this task. And, uh, and their, their boss who, who reports to me will say, well, you know, I, I think this and this, and I'll say, look, this is your, this is your area. You, you, you run it. You do it. Um, you're responsible ultimately, and if you think you have the right team, then then go get them. Um, and I think, generally speaking, not everybody needs to or expects to or wants to have their boss's job. They may think, okay, one day I want that, but what they really want is autonomy. They just want to. They, they want to be trusted to do what it is that, that they're supposed to do. And, um, if you have a culture of people not micromanaging each other, and, and, and that goes the other way too, and uh, not, you know, um, not obsessing about you know, blame when things go wrong, because when things are gonna go wrong, um, and our approach generally is, you know, when something goes wrong, let's, let's drill down and figure out the root cause of it. The root cause is almost never uh, a, a person uh, who, who somehow failed. The root cause is almost always the, system or the process. There's 
something about the process that enabled that, and so they figured that out rather than blaming a person. Uh, every now and then, you've got people that aren't up to it, but uh, that also tends to make people feel like they're in a place where they're going to grow and you know they're going to learn. And and over time, you know, I, I've I've said this to folks on my team that you know this is this is not a job. If I'm still doing this job when I'm old, well then you know we've done something wrong from a succession and planning standpoint because uh, at, at some point you, you do need to refresh leadership because there's some young person in our company right now or maybe not in our company right now who's got better ideas than I do about how to run an organization and that'll probably be the better person for the job one day. And you're investing in them right now for that, right for that time. So you know, return on that investment. So as I understand, it's almost hard to just outside the boat. You know, you've been bumping up over your seat field here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have no idea uh, about that. So, so, so we'll get to that in a second. That's got to be kind of obviously one of your career highs at this point. But you, you also experienced some others in this in this seat, right? So there was a time when. Um, the deal that made JPG Smith seem very much in doubt, um, and that you know that that gravity's got to got to come at you. Talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah, um, and it, it was more than one failure. I mean, these were, you know, these, these, when when you look at deals, deals either happen or they don't happen, and when they don't happen, uh, at the time it's a failure. Now, when you have the fullness of time and you look back, sometimes you realize, okay, you know, I'm, I'm glad that one didn't happen. Uh, and we've had plenty of those, there are plenty of deals we've tried to acquire a building and we lost. And we were really disappointed that we lost. And then two, three, four years later, we thought, oh, thank God we lost uh, because that thing, you know, went sideways. Um, and we had a little bit of that, but uh, yeah, the, the, the pre-Amazon time period of a, of a couple of years, <coughs> Was uh, was a, a real roller coaster. I mean, if, if you know, we the, the whole tornado thing really started in 2013. You know, they they reached out and said, "Hey, we've got this idea," and the idea was we want to take the you know basically the Charles E. Smith stuff here, and we just want to bolt your management company onto it and have have you guys run it. And uh, you know, they were offering a, a lot of money and. Um, we were thinking, gee, I don't, I don't know, do we even want to be a public company? I don't know, we haven't even thought about this uh, in a while, we have thought about it, but um, you know, do we, uh, what's the relationship gonna be with Tornado New York? Is that, how, how does that all work? Who's on the board? How do we figure those things out? They have a very different culture, a very different style, and is that, are we gonna have our own uh, culture? Um, and then uh, our investors, you know, we've managed money in our funds for our investors. If, if we if we basically monetize our our platform and leave them behind, they're gonna look at us and say, you know, yeah, what, yeah. what are you guys doing? Yeah. You guys are selling us out and we're not getting we're not getting anything out of this. So we so we said, uh, we said, look, um, we'll entertain this if it's a good deal for our investors, but that means we've gotta take at least half the assets out of our funds and, and contribute those to the deal also. We don't want this just to be a, a retread of Charles E. Smith. We want it to be something new and bigger. And, um, and you know, Steve Roth was, was um, I think somewhat, no, I don't think he was confused, but he was just surprised. Uh, he, he thought we were being schmucks. You know, you, you, and at one point he said, you know, who works for who? You know, do you work for your investors or do they work for you? And we kind of thought, well, that's, that, we don't, we don't, we don't think of it that way. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it was just a very different view. He, he was just very surprised that, you know, here he was offering a, a, a lot of money to us. And we had every right to take it. There was nothing in our fund documents that would have prevented us. In fact, we didn't even know that. But we went back and we read our fund documents and we thought, wow, we can actually go do this. <laughs> These are really good documents for us. Uh, but we didn't uh, take advantage of it. In fact, to the point where uh, we spent 18 months then on that deal. Um, and, uh, and then it, it, it just didn't, it didn't happen. There was, there was, neither we nor uh, Ornado could, could honestly figure out whether we should 
continue in the funds business or not while having this public company over here? How do you get around the conflicts of where the deals go? And, um, and there, there really isn't a great answer to that. Uh, you, you don't, so you kind of do one or the other, basically, um, unless your whole business is funds, like Blackstone or Carlisle or something like that, but that's a very different kind of business. And, and we, this was sort of in between, and it was an uncomfortable in between. So, um, it, so, so it, it, things broke off, and then, um, and then we tried. Well, you know, we, we were so intrigued by this notion of actually going public. We said, well, let's let's just try it on our own. So we spent the next year getting ready and going through the process. And we actually we had to get uh, I think thirteen or fourteen of our fund investors who sit on various fund advisory committees all to approve doing that. And um, the level of trust there was so high that um, they approved our going public at a valuation to be determined by us. So there was no awareness on their part of whether you know the value would meet their test or not. They just trusted that we would make that call. Um, recognizing that there's an inherent conflict when you're selling real estate and you know that you own you know a small part of and a business alongside of it that you own all of. And so um, the market didn't cooperate. So we weren't able to really do that. We couldn't really go public. And so we got through the whole spent a year, uh, several million dollars, you know, tens of thousands of hours of time of people just getting, you know, these confidential SEC filings. Um, file and um, and then the market kind of went away on us and then uh, the this whole New York REIT transaction came up and you know the company had been put on the block for sale and you know the broker called us and said you know we heard you guys are thinking about going public this could be a way this could be a win-win um, negotiated with their management team made a deal uh, and so we kind of we, we this was this was how naive we were about to sort of how you know who has the real power in that kind of situation in the in the public markets, uh, you know you can't you can't call up one of those shareholders and you know uh, kind of sanity check something, right? Because it just doesn't work that way in the public markets. And uh, there's this this you know uh, this information wall between you know what's material and non-public and what isn't. And so, uh, but we just assumed that their management team. Would have a good sense of what would work and what wouldn't, and the deal they negotiated. Why would they waste their time negotiating a deal that wasn't going to work? But in fact, that's exactly what happened. And so, um, you know, within days of the deal kind of being out there, it was very clear that the shareholders really didn't like this. They they just wanted cash for their company. They didn't want stock and something based in Washington with a mix of uses. And they they just thought, you know. And so, two months later. We terminated that deal uh, after lots of drama and everything else. And so here we are, Vernado round one, you know, standalone IPO, you know, you know Vernado fail, standalone IPO fail, New York Reed fail. And you know, we got to the end of the New York Reed thing and our team was just exhausted, just totally spent. And uh, at this point it had been you know, three years. And then uh, Steve Roth calls again and says, hey, you know, I saw your, your brief deal died. <laughs> I've been following you guys. And, uh, and at this point, you know, everybody got each other. All that, you know, that we didn't, didn't, didn't need to get to know one another at all. But, and, and I, you know, I think the first, I actually think all that stuff helped. Because I think the first time around, Steve Roth probably looked at me and said, you know, who's this kid? Uh, you know, he's half my age. He's, he's, he can't do this. But then I think he saw, you know, that I and my, my partners, it wasn't just me, but that, you know, there, there, there is sort of, uh, as my wife would say, you know, uh, in, not in a, not in a complimentary way, uh, you know, that I can be like a dog with a bone. And, and, and that's kind of what we were doing, you know, we were, we were not going to give up on this, this idea because it just, it just made too much sense to, to take, you know, the, the things that, that the, the Vernado Charles E. Smith portfolio needed and the things that our team was good at doing really made all the sense in the world to put together. And it seems silly that some of these little things were thwarting that and getting in the way. And so, 
anyway, you know, it, it, when it came time to actually make a deal, things things went so fast. Yeah. I mean, it, it it we we had our first sort of get back together in mid August, and it was maybe six weeks later that Tornado had their first, uh, or really not first, but where they had their um, the board conversation. It's not a meeting or a decision, it's just a conversation. Because if it's a decision about something material like that, you have to disclose it within 24 hours. And so it was just a, you know, get a sense of the board kind of thing. And um, and so, and that was, you know, when I, I, I went up to New York and, you know, sat um, at the head of their board table with, you know, their management team and their board and their bankers and their lawyers. And, um, Couple people on the phone, and the volume was really high, so it was kind of like, uh, and you know, and basically was interviewed like this with Steve Roth interviewing me in front of the board about you know what are you going to do with this, what are you going to do with that, um, and you know about an hour later, you know, left the room, and and he came out an hour after that and said, you know, uh, everybody everybody thinks you're awfully young, uh, you don't you don't really have the New York swagger thing down, so. <laughs> They, they, some of them like to see that, but uh, but you know they'll they'll uh, you know they'll go along with it. <laughs> you know, like, okay, well, it's great. So it so that took you know that was four years, yeah. basically four years and a couple of months to get from the first conversation to that point, and then we had to you know of course we had eight months to you know, <laughs> close it and then launch this thing, and then six weeks after we launched, uh, you know Amazon put this little thing out there about. A new headquarters, and we thought, well, you know, who knows? I mean, this is this thing. It's, they're probably not going to come here. They're probably not going to pick us. But you know, it's so big, we've got to participate. Right. So, four or five years to an overnight success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, it, so, so, and I, I win. Whoever is betting me, how long will it take for you to get to Amazon? <laughs> um, so, Amazon deal shows up. Um, you guys obviously jump in. Fairly, fairly quickly, it seems like this region is going to be kind of one of the one of the real you know short list regions. Um, and then you're at the table with a bunch of your colleagues and your partners, and, and you kind of stop things and you talk to them a little bit about the moment that they're in. Tell me a little bit about that moment for you. Yeah. So this was uh, this past October, <laughs> and we were in Seattle. Um, and you know it was very funny because I was I was getting text messages and inbound questions from you know investors, from uh, journalists, not Dan but others, <laughs> um, saying you know are you in Seattle right now? Uh, you know everybody the speculation is just uh, at a fever pitch and um, so this was uh, you know the better part of a week that we spent in Seattle. And we had been invited there three weeks prior to basically tour their headquarters and see how they live in their natural habitat. <laughs> and then uh, sit in the conference room and uh, try to make a deal. And, and I mean, we were so focused on you know every little word, you know, and, and uh, the, the message actually came to me. I was having my wife and I were having dinner with a guy who used to work for us maybe 10 years ago and his wife. And I um, hadn't seen him in years, and so we, you know, we went out to dinner, and then we get in, get the Uber on the way home, and I've got this voicemail you know, from their head of real estate. Uh, and in the voicemail, he said, you know, we want to invite you to come out to Seattle to you know, tour and, you know, and you know, execute documents. And, and you know, I'm thinking, oh my god, they want us to execute documents. You know, it's our deal. And he, he was probably, you know, watching TV while he left me the voicemail, and, you know, some story about someone being executed. <laughs> like, you know, that word got in there, because that's not really what he meant. <laughs> I'm, of course, thinking, oh my god, this is, you know, playing it for the folks back in the office. It's like, execute! <laughs> execute the documents! It's not real! You know, it, and so, anyway, it, so, so, I mean, it's just the ups and downs of that whole thing. So we, so we get to Seattle, and um, we're in this conference room that uh, is, you know, overlooking the skyline of the city. And um, there, there was a 
an initial uh, negotiation where, um, uh, well, well, first I'd say we started the morning touring building, and then we came back and had lunch, and then everybody broke for about a half an hour before we were going to come back to actually start negotiating. And um, and so so we had there there were there were five of us and then two uh, attorneys. We had a leasing attorney and a and a um, uh, kind of a purchase and sale attorney, uh, if you will, somebody who, who done a lot of this for us. And so the seven of us were sitting there, and um, you know I really enjoy this kind of thing, haggling and you know all of that. And um, and so we're in this conference room, and I said. I said to everybody, I said, look, and, and I was kind of saying it to myself too, that, you know, like we may not be sitting here do, or, or anywhere like this doing anything like this ever again. Uh, and, and this is, this could be the biggest deal we ever worked on. Certainly as a, you know, a real estate deal like this. Um, and, you know, we may not win, but, you know, we're here right now. We're at the, we're at the finish line, basically, you know, we're on, we're, I know the silver medal maybe doesn't mean that much, <laughs> uh, but you know we're we're on the we're on the we're on the podium uh, one way or another, and this is pretty awesome. This is a reflection of all the hard work everybody's put into this. Uh, you know, we should all just take a deep breath and really, you know, inhale this moment right now because it's it, it's going to be here and gone, and, and, and if, if, especially if we win. This is the moment when you know we will have made the deal. This is what we're what we're about to do. In the next couple of hours is basically going to dictate what the deal is if we're going to win this thing. And you know, um, one of you know, one of them was sitting there uh, looking at me, and and he go, he goes he goes, you're fucking crazy. <laughs> And I said, I said, well, I said, you know, I said, look, this is this is real, and this this is really the it, it, it was the most fun, exciting, high stress, uh, you know, during the course of 2018, I lost 10 pounds, um, and it, you know, and it's not like I wasn't eating; I was eating normally, sleeping normally. It was just the nervous energy of this whole thing, um, and uh, you know, my that that drives my wife nuts. By the way, she's like. You know, I would talk about gaining back my Amazon weight. Like, Shut up! Stop talking! This is so annoying. Um, but uh, but no, it really was. You know, it, it was a 14-month-long process, and the, um, that that moment towards the end was really that 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 was really the the crux of the whole negotiation and the deal making, and and you know, we we had all the team working on it. Spent so much time and energy on this thing, and to be sitting there at that moment, um, making that deal, uh, was was pretty amazing uh, experience. I can only imagine. So this is the point at which I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to open it up to the room. So we'll start to come up with what they want to ask. So you mentioned earlier, you know, you like the notion of being able to control your own destiny, and this is a deal where. I mean, you control a lot of things, but you know, we live in a region where cooperation isn't always the watchword. So, so how did you, from sort of the first time heard about the deal to that table, how did you think about corralling all of the interests that you had to corral in order to get to that table and actually have you know sort of the meaningful discussion that you can have? Yeah, that, that's a great question because that was um, that was kind of a first. For us, you know, we, we've had smaller projects where you've got, you know, maybe a county and some neighborhood associations and a tenant, and you're you're trying to, but the stakes are usually pretty small and the size is small and there's not a lot of focus on it. Um, here, you know, we had to, to say nothing of, of the multiple regions that all kind of thought they were still in the game, even when they really weren't. Um, you know, even just within Northern Virginia, you know, you've got Arlington and Alexandria, and, and you've got everybody from Arlington and Alexandria. It's not just, you know, county staff. It's, you know, all the board members. And um, you have the, you know, the state uh, politicians. I mean, you know, we, we were having meetings uh, with, with members of the state, House, and Senate, 
for members of the committee that was approving Amazon's incentive package because they had questions about all kinds of stuff. And you know, we, we flew to Blacksburg to have a meeting with the team from Virginia Tech just to talk about that. But you know, one of the um, representatives in the, in the, at the state level who serves on that committee, the incentives committee, wanted to meet separately just to talk about talk about housing in, in this region because he was he was interested in understanding what you know he just didn't know he didn't know what's the you know I've, I've heard about this as an issue I want to understand it um, and it was it, you know we, we would never have that kind of interaction you know with, with somebody you know in Southwest Virginia about a project in uh, Arlington or Alexandria. But there was that level of focus on all of this. And it would, the one thing actually that I was heartened by was the fact that the, the committee that approved the incentives did not include a single representative from Northern Virginia. So it was, it was all members of, uh, of, the, um, of, of the state Congress from elsewhere, other parts of Virginia. And um, it was majority Republican. And, uh, but, but only slightly. And it was, to me, very heartening to see how interested and concerned they were about all of the local issues that, that we talk about all the time, you know, transportation, housing, education. I mean, it was really all about that. And, you know, you, you, you could see somebody from, uh, you know, a region outside of Northern Virginia being more focused on just the tax revenue that's coming into the state and what's gonna come to their area, but they, they were actually really concerned about the state as a whole, all parts of it, and all of these issues. So, and these are folks who, you know, they're these aren't full-time jobs. I mean, these are part-time jobs for these folks. That, that, that pay is very low, and so they all, you know, supplement their. That, that this is uh, just a small supplement to their income generally, but they're, they they spend a lot of time and a lot of focus on those types of issues. So that. Um, but that was a full-time effort, coordinating and communicating and spending time with those constituents. And then the federal delegation, um, there wasn't, there wasn't a, uh, a whole lot of information flow necessarily. You know, it's not like there was one team working on this. You had like 10 different teams of people doing different things. So we would get calls from you know, Mark Warner or Tim Kaine, uh, you know, a lot of times trading information, you know, Warner's, you know, close with Jay Carney, and he said, well, I talked to Jay, and this is what Jay told me, you know, what are you hearing? Um, we would get calls from people in other markets. You know, I've got friends in other markets who were also chasing this thing, and, you know, you'd have to, I'd have to think about, okay, what answer can I give? Because I know I'm gonna be talking to this person for the next 20, 30 years, so what answer can I give now? Or they're not gonna say, you know, dude, you know, you, Oh, yeah, you know, like me. Like, you know, I can't do that, so I need to. Um, and then, uh, you know, our investors. Um, so there, there was just, there was so much. There were so many people. And, and so basically, we, would, we, we had, you know, 15 people or so on our team plugged in in all, in all these different directions with all of these different groups. And we would just meet once a week, sometimes twice a week, just to go around and share everything that was being communicated and that was happening. And so, it, it, and that was for, you know, a good six months. And we, we still do that to some degree because, you know, we're at the table for a lot of the things that are transportation. I mean, you saw the Virginia Tech announcement last week. We're involved in that. Um, we're at the table for a lot of the transportation related uh, investments that are happening because a lot of them are happening on, on land that we own so we have to be there and be coordinated and so that's a that's an ongoing uh, effort as well so it, it it was unlike any other project we've ever had um, and then and then put all of that in the context of being a publicly traded company where we have to we've got to be mindful of okay anytime we do something that triggers a disclosure requirement, we have to and so there was lots of negotiating with Amazon along the way about, okay, you know, we've got to disclose this and this and this, and they would say, well, you know, no one discloses these things. These are, you know, these are these are tiny little deals, and you know, we're thinking, well, actually, this is a massive deal, um, and we, for us, it is. It's not material for a trillion dollar company, but for an eight billion dollar company, this is pretty darn material. So we've got to disclose it, and so there was there was just so much of that that. Um, it was really amazing to me. We had a, a, an investor conference, uh, one in April and one in May. 
and we kind of went through the laundry list of all the things that we've, we've done since we became a public company. We focused a lot on 2018, but um, what really amazed me was how much our team got done in addition to Amazon. I mean, Amazon gets all this attention, rightly so, but our team also got done. You know, we we you know merged all of these backend systems. Uh, implemented a new payroll system, became Sarbanes-Oxley compliant, uh, you know, it ramped up a, a, a you know, whole new level of accounting apparatus to deal with publicly, being a publicly traded company. Um, had a lot of new people come in place, new chief accounting officer, new chief financial officer, new chief legal officer, new head of leasing and asset management, um, new head of HR. It, we just, we had a lot of, um, change going on yeah. and you know people um, people rose the challenge but but it was a lot and you talk about built building the cars you're driving it down the road right in a lot of places right yeah. all right let's start over here um, oh, no. <laughs> thank you uh kevin reggie class of 13. <clears throat> I, I heard it said uh entrepreneur recently that uh success is a lousy milieu for learning. Another way this was put before binary choices. You can win or you can learn. You talked about uh, oh, some uh, successes and some setbacks that you had to have under leadership and otherwise. I wonder if you could speak to this from a personal and from an organizational perspective in terms of culture. What is it from your vantage point about setbacks that can be so essential for growth? It's a great question. Um, I, uh, when I when I talk to people about this sort of conversation and about you know the, the Amazon success, I, I, I usually raise a couple things. You know, I, I went to um, Harvard Business School where you have a lot of successful graduates, and they bring them back to talk about the you know, the case that was written about their success, and you, know, you have. Uh, you know, guest speaker after guest speaker, they all come in and they talk about, you know, how they did this and they did this and then, and then they made a hundred million dollars and then they leave. And, you know, the next one comes, they made a hundred million dollars and then they leave. And you're like, God, you know, everybody graduates from this place. Uh, I'm a total loser if I don't do that. And, and it leaves you thinking, well, where, what about all the other stories? What about all the other people who, you know, they levered up 17 credit cards to start their business, which then failed? Uh, you know, what about that one? Um, and, uh, and I, I, I still tell them this, I said, you need to have classes on failure where you bring in all the failures so that people, because you do learn a lot more from the failures than anything else. Um, you know, I, I was engaged to somebody else before I met my wife and, you know, that failed and, you know, broke it off and that experience taught me a lot about what I was really looking for, which is why when I met my wife, you know, we got married 10 months later, um, you know, you just, it, it prepares you in so many ways. I think in business, um, you know, the failures were horrible and they're not fun and it's stressful and sleepless and, you know, you wonder, am I ever gonna figure it out? Um, am I, you know, delusional? Am I trying to do something that's not doable? Um, I, I, uh, I remember one of my kids was looking at some article about the Amazon thing and and uh, he made some comments about how, well, you know, well, you, you know, you, you succeed at everything. And, and, I, and I said, you know, I was kind of struck by that. And I said, well, actually, I said, do, do you know how many times I failed trying to do this? Um, and, you know, you, you, you were too young when that happened to, to see that. You're old enough to see this. But I said, you can't forget the fact that it, it's only because of the failures that you actually learn what to change and how to adjust. And, you know, the, the failed tornado negotiation, if we, had we not had that, there's no way we could have gotten a deal done in six weeks. And because we got a deal done in six weeks, you know, we, we, we were able to actually pull it off and get to the finish line. Um, and and my, my own view is that what, the, what, what I feel like I learned from the failures is that two things. One, it, it can only get, it can only get so bad. You, you, you can, you know, it, you fail, and you know the world doesn't, uh, you know, implode. Uh, you, you you fail, and so the risk of trying again is actually pretty low. 
but if you haven't failed, you don't know that. If you haven't failed, you, you, your mind kind of runs through all the what ifs and how bad it could get. And you realize it's it's actually not it's actually not as bad, um, at, at least in our context in terms of what we were doing, um, as as you might fear that it's going to be. Um, but you also you also learn so much. I mean, one of the things that we were struck with um, is spending time with the Amazon folks and trying to understand which teams they had and which buildings. And they were talking about all these different products that they've tried that have failed. And you know, the the notion of failure in our society, I think, is is a huge asset for us because failure is kind of a badge. You know, it 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 was one of the things that I thought about when going uh, and starting the, the uh, software company with my co-founders was I thought, okay, best case this will succeed and maybe we'll you know um, create some wealth out of it. Maybe we'll get some great experience. Maybe we'll you know build build a company that you know we will run or somebody else will run, but we'll build something. Um, worst case, you know, we'll have a we'll have a great story. This will be a great story of what we learned about it. And in a lot of cultures, that's not the case. Um, you know, in the UK, I don't know if it's still the case, uh, it used to be that if you were an officer of a publicly traded company that went bankrupt, you were prohibited from serving as an officer of a publicly traded company for the next eight years. Well, that, that's, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I mean, those are the people who are you know, best equipped and who've got the fresh lessons. You know, you're gonna make them wait until the lessons are stale and they can't remember anymore. Uh, so I, I, I do actually think it, it's healthy and incredibly valuable to, to be able to fail and what you learn from failing. Um, and, and you know, I think uh, you, you hear this a lot from people who have succeeded after failing. And so it's, you know, that's a skewed perspective. My perspective is a skewed perspective. If we had failed the fourth time around with Grenado, I don't know. I don't know if I would have wanted to come in and you know, if you want to talk about you know, how much of a failure you are right. um, to everybody. So it, it is hard, I think, to get that perspective. But um, I think be, it would be really interesting and worthwhile if we focused a little more on that and we had people come in and talk about you know what went wrong. And um, but we did try to do some of that internally and try to have some of that you know why, why did why didn't this work? You know, we're all reasonable people. We generally have a good sense of what what it, what it takes to make deal work. What like what, what are we missing here? So Terry Copeland with PNC actually um, I'm the market manager for Greater Washington and Community Development Banking, and we have recently worked with your team AJ Jackson and the, with the whole WHI WGS um, housing. Thank you. Really from, thank you. And I was so the two things I actually want to ask you. I really want to hear about the moment you actually found out you got the deal, but that's that's one thing. The thing I wanted to, I was curious about is the impact, as we know, is a big, big concern about the impact on housing in the area from this Amazon relocation for headquarters too. And you guys started this, act, when did you start the activity of creating this affordable housing equity fund? And was it, as a result of this pursuit of Amazon, or did, was it just coincidental in the timing? And then I want to follow it with, so Google announced they were going to do a billion dollars in Seattle or wherever it is, um, yesterday or two days yeah, ago. San Francisco, the Bay Area. Thank you, Bay Area, affordable housing. And that's one of the things that I'm curious about with Amazon and how much they're going to actually contribute here to alleviate or make sure that we don't worsen the problem of affordable housing. Just curious to hear you talk about that. Um, yeah, so the, I'll take them in order. Um, the call came in the Monday, Veterans Day, so I was at home, working from home, and um, it, uh, we, we had known that something was coming and that there was going to be, uh, we were organizing for a press conference, basically. Um, but it wasn't official, official yet. And at one point, we even had somebody starting to set up a tent uh, on the site, and then someone in one of the buildings took a picture and tweeted it or something. And we were like, "Oh God, okay, you know, shut that down. No, no setting up tents. No, it's just like this. Wait." Um, and that was really the governor's office was, you know, kind of not 
pushing that, but was wanting to know that you know we were going to be ready. And um, that's why we did the announcement inside the warehouse, uh, not next door. Um, but uh, so yeah, the, the call came in. Um, I think it was early afternoon, and um, I was at home, and it was kind of like a you know call sharing information. You know that you, pro you probably already know this. Uh, but, you know, it's official now. And at this point, there had been so much speculation or, or so much uh, publicly articulated about how this was a fait accompli and the deal is done and it's going here and, and it's, you know, it's going to be, even though it's going to be split. And uh, we did not know about Nashville. I hadn't heard that there was any part of this that was going to Nashville. So that was news to, to me at the time. Uh, it being split, I, I wasn't surprised by that. Um, and uh, it was more, and I've, I've said this before, it was more just relief because at this point, uh, you know, it, it, this, it, we were no longer in the zone of, well, we might win, we might lose. It was everyone expects that we're going to win, and so if we lose, that's, that's a really bad. Uh, that's going to be really bad. And because uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of explaining to do, and, you know, we'll have to really understand that. Um, uh, so, it, it was more just relief, like okay, you know, and and but also kind of like uh, you know what, what's this going to be like now? I mean, this is now it's we, we had everything kind of confined to a relatively small group of people talking about this, and now you know it's things like this, you know, it's lots of this kind of stuff and lots of others involved and really are you know focused on this and interested in this and um, and, and so it, it, it was a. It, it was obviously a very uh, exciting moment, but it was more excitement born out of relief. Uh, there wasn't the alternative than, you know, because the excitement of, of winning it had already, was already kind of there, it was already kind of building up. You try to sprout it out, and you know, we would have town hall meetings, and I would tell people, look, we have to expect that we're gonna lose. Expect we're going to lose. Okay, we're losing, that's what's happening. <laughs> don't, don't get excited, yeah. We're, yeah, we're not losers, but we're going to lose this. And if we win, that's great. And if we don't win, everything's just fine. We're a great company, great team, great projects. Um, nothing to see here. Uh, and so, um, and, but your other question about, about the housing initiative, that idea first started percolating four or five years ago with, and, and we kind of got distracted. It, it was, we, we didn't have a person dedicated. We didn't have AJ dedicated to it. Um, and so it was, it was never a full-time you know, drive for somebody to really push it. But the idea um, arose from, so we have a, a, in our funds, we had a, a number, still have a number of charitable foundations who are investors. And charitable foundations have what they call the program side of the house and the investments side of the house. The investment side of the house invests all the money of the foundation in whatever the highest returning things they can find are. And they don't, they're not thinking about the mission of the foundation. They're just investing for return. The program side of the house has, by law, has to give away 5% of what they have every year. The investment side is trying to generate returns that exceed 5% so that the thing always grows and doesn't shrink and continue to serve the mission and be perpetual. The program side and the investment side are often totally disconnected and don't really talk much to each other. In the tax code, there's a provision that allows for what is called program-related investments, which is you can invest in something that generates a below market rate of return as long as it's consistent with the mission of the program. And uh, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we, if we had, if there was a foundation, one, who, one of whose missions was housing, where we could, we could take that below market return seeking money and invest it in filling the gap that needs to be filled in order to take housing that is in the path of growth and compete with market rate buyers by having cheaper money to buy it and then put covenants in place that keep the rent growth basically tracking at wage growth, not you know growing at 4% a year, which wages are not, but maybe one and a half, something like that. Um, turns out that, uh, and, and so we spent a lot of time cooking up this mousetrap to put it in front of some of those folks. We put it in front of them, and a lot of them just couldn't get out of their own way. They, they, they became 
so focused on uh, the different services provided in these investments that you know they said, well, we said we're going to have childcare services, food assistance, job training, transportation assistance, and they would say, well, what kind of transportation assistance? We really want to get involved, and we would say, oh my God. We, we can't be having that conversation with 20 different foundations about all that. And so it, it, it basically didn't work. But what we found along the way was that, thanks to the Community Reinvestment Act, there was a different way to structure this thing that would make it CRA eligible, which would enable a lot of the banks, which actually did have a well-worn path for making these kinds of investments, because a lot of foundations, this was just brand new. They just didn't know how to deal with this, the banks do. There's, there are people who deal with that, and there's a process, and there's a, a form memo you can print out and fill out with all the information, and that actually counts for a lot when you're trying to do something like this. Even then, it's still kind of new. This whole thing is new. We, we had a, a meeting with a big tech company on the West Coast uh, earlier this week, and um, half the meeting we spent talking about this uh, because that is such a huge crisis issue out there. Uh, and so our, our view was, look, um, housing, I don't think anybody here would say housing is cheap, but when you look at housing in, in this market as a, as a job center, and you compare it to Boston, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, um, it, it, relatively speaking, we're the least expensive of those cities. And so if you think, okay, we may have you know, Amazon growing here plus others, uh, if, if we can start trying to tackle the issue now, then we may have a shot at actually getting ahead of that issue. So um, we ended up about a year ago bringing AJ on board because this thing had gotten to a place where it was pretty well baked, pretty well formed. It now needed a full-time dedicated owner. We, we couldn't have this be a side project. And, and there were some people who wanted it to, they, you know, they wanted it to be their side project. And, um, you know, I had to have some tough conversations with people who basically say, well, if you want to do that, you need to find someone else to do your day job because this is not a half-time job. It needs to be full-time, and, and we've since added people to do it. But um, it is one of a kind so far in the country. And, 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 and basically what it, what it does is it allows us to identify naturally occurring affordable. And so it's the renter who's earning between 60 and 100% of AMI who today, there really is no assistance for those people. And um, the, the below 60%, uh, there's not enough assistance for those renters either, but there are lots of programs, existing programs, and the gap is so wide that the amount of capital needed, we thought, initially speaking anyway, we thought, we don't know if we can raise enough of that kind of capital. And it, and it won't, that kind of capital won't generate really any return. And so it, that, that, makes it, that makes it not ineligible, but very unattractive to a lot of the banks who do have CRA alternatives that do generate some return. And so that's why we thought, well, this one, there's, there's lots of that capital out there. Let's just go try to direct it towards this. And so we kind of look at it as the early intervention stage of, of housing. If we, can, if we can enable people who are middle-income renters who live close to where there's lots of gentrification and growth, to continue to live close to that, a lot of those people will then benefit from new jobs created right in their backyard or their front yard and be able to work in some of those companies but not have to commute an hour and a half in order to go to work, which has negative outcomes. You know, the farther you commute, the less likely you're able to keep your job. And, and that can become what starts the downward spiral from a housing standpoint. So we can try to prevent that. Um, We'll address that issue, and we'll also have a better shot at preserving housing equity in a lot of these neighborhoods. Because building lots of new housing creates lots of high-end housing, generally, and a very small amount of affordable housing, because the, the percentages are just small, and um, there's not a whole lot in the middle, and this is really a way to try to preserve some of what's in the middle, and to have all of that in one neighborhood, and, and to have it be in neighborhoods where there's a lot of other investment coming so that we can help try to improve some of the outcomes with, with that renter population. Thank you very much for that vision. And I want to acknowledge Keith Dennis, who actually took and ran the ball and came through for that investment. Thank you.
Matt Jim Denninger at the American University's Kogod School of Business. Kogod as a school of business. Mr. Smith as a school of business. The yeah. Smith companies have really made quite a mark in the great arts region as it relates to business. Um, it wasn't so long ago that Amazon put out an eight page, essentially RFP, very specific, it said, Figure space and this and transportation access and the rest, and yet while you'd think maybe 30 places could have fit in that, over 200, pushing 300 places, started sending packets and other gifts south Amazon. <laughs> when you think back, and it's not many years, who do you see as your competition? And a little bit of what did you see as the risks? I'll remind you that the Metro funding came through at almost the 11th hour, so that wasn't all of a sudden a big liability, but who do you see as the big competition? And then what did you see as the big liabilities for the school? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the Metro funding is a great example because uh, I firmly believe that the, that the real motivating force was Amazon. That Nobody in the region wanted to be dealing with a metro crisis in the midst of Amazon's selection decision. Um, you know, we we uh, we nicknamed our office Speculation Station because everybody was coming up with a new theory every week, every month about who are we competing with, where else are they looking. Uh, you know, there were articles about you know Bezos' plane is stopping in Columbus, Ohio a lot, maybe. Um, you know, they hire more Ohio State grads than any other university in the country. They're going there. Um, we have people from time to time who, I probably have four or five of these stories where somebody would say, you know, I was sitting on a plane behind someone who works in HR at Amazon, and they were saying they're spending a lot of time in Philly. And, oh my God, it's gonna be Philly. Uh, you know, we really had no, we really had no idea until the last month or two in the last month or two, we actually thought of Chicago and Dallas. We, we thought those were the two markets, and uh, you know, they, I, I think they were spending time there. Um, but we never knew if these rumors were coming from the jurisdiction or from you know somebody inside Amazon. Um, one of the things that we had heard along the way was that, and I don't know if this is true, but that you know Amazon was uh, feeding stories to the Wall Street Journal. Because every time a leak would come out, the next day there'd be a story in the journal that would come out that would kind of set the record straight. And you know, I thought, well, I could see why they wouldn't want to give it to the Times because the Times and the Post are a bit more, um, and uh, and certainly they can't give it to the Post. And so you know, that makes sense. Now I don't know if that's true. Um, but uh, you know, there, there there was all kinds of speculation going on. And we, we didn't think Boston was really a competitor because the site in Boston was more suburban, closer to Revere, uh, the Suffolk Downs site. We thought, you know, if Amazon had a history of doing things more like what uh, Facebook, you know, did in Menlo Park with their own campus, um, which by the way, is all basically single story buildings. For any of you who've been out there, I mean, we talk about the, the housing crisis in the Bay Area and you look at the low rise scale of that whole city, for the most part, except for the downtown, very high rise, um, it's no wonder that they're out of office space and they're out of space for housing because when you, when you have NIMBYs who force you to build one story buildings and you sprawl like this, you quickly run out of land area. But um, we, we knew Amazon didn't want to build a suburban campus that was far outside of the center of the city and that's kind of what was on offer in Boston. So we didn't really think Boston was a big competitor. Um, New York, we really didn't think had, uh, we, we weren't really thinking about Long Island City, we were thinking more Manhattan. And we just thought, you know, the cost there is so high that uh, it was gonna be a challenge for, for the math to work. Um, but I think we weren't, we weren't appropriately weighting the importance of just labor force, existing workforce for fast hiring. Uh, and I think if we had been, then we would have said, you know, New York is a real uh, viable competitor. Uh, and obviously it was. Um, we thought that places like Philly could be contenders because they had big sites that were more urban, downtown. And Amazon does like um, 
to make their mark. They like to be part of, um, you know, revitalizing something. They did that in South Lake Union, and they take a lot of pride in that. Um, and I think they're, they're, that's one of the things that attracted them to here and to Long Island City. Um, and I think, I think the fact that you know, they were proposing to do something that they thought was very constructive in Long Island City, but that was received you know, 180 degrees opposite, uh, it left them feeling like, okay, this really isn't, this really isn't the place for us. But um, besides those cities, we really didn't have uh, a, a clear sense of who, you know, one of our, one of, one of our team members Went, uh, went to a wedding in Columbus, Ohio, and came back and said, you know, Columbus is a really cool town. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, oh my god, we're all in Columbus. Columbus, we should all go. Um, so we just, we, we really didn't know. And uh, every week I'd come in and I'd say, you know, uh, you know, Dallas, like what, you know, go figure out everything you can about Dallas, make the case for Dallas, you know, and they, the, the next week we'd come back and, you know, you, you couldn't really go deep enough on the things that we knew Amazon was going deep on, uh, at, you know, as an armchair observer of some of these cities to really know, and they weren't they weren't giving up very much. Last question. Last question. Uh, Steve Mamla, class of 2013, at Hunts Paramount. It's great, great uh, presentation. So, um, ABD has been around for a long time and has enjoyed a lot of success in the area, uh, but it's, it's pretty rooted into this into this area in many ways. Um, I guess I have really two questions. Is it curious how this Amazon deal has impacted your organization's ability to continue to participate in other deals? Has it helped or hurt? And I guess the second question is a leader is there a risk of not staying grounded as an organization and looking forward and long term at other things besides this? And just kind of culturally, how did, does it? Is there a risk of not staying grounded as it, uh, and, and continuing forward? How do you manage that? Great question. Um, you know, as far as making things harder or easier, I think uh, one way in which it makes things harder is that you know, to the extent we want to go buy anything that is in National Landing anywhere near Amazon. Uh, you know, a seller who knows it's us talking may think, well, what do they know that I don't know? Um, and, you know, is there is there some reason why I need to just ask for more because of who it is who, who's buying? Um, and that's happened to us in other neighborhoods, you know, where we start to assemble, you know, a concentration. Uh, so that's not really a new thing, but it's certainly, you know, from a scale standpoint, um, I think the there, I think there's also a perception that you know our, our plate must just be so full that we can't take on anything new, uh, which is which is totally untrue. I mean we we are certainly busy, but um, we've built this scale of stuff in terms of what we're doing for Amazon uh, before, not in a single project like we're doing, but we've done it before in terms of having. You know, five, 10, 15 projects going on at once that constitute millions of feet, which in some sense you could argue is even harder because each of those are in different jurisdictions and different timelines and different clients and different tenants and other things. But um, that's certainly, I think, a perception that is out there um, that, you know, we try to dispel that. You know, we, we are out looking for new deals. Um, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking to uh, other prospective tenants, and one of the things we have to try to educate people on is that this is a big market, and even National Landing is a big market. Amazon's a big tenant, but you know, there's still only going to be a you know minority of that market. So they're they're not you know taking up all the oxygen there. They're 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 one of many, and there's lots of room for others. Um, and I think some people get that, but some people just don't know because you know they they think of Seattle. South Lake Union, where even there, you know, Amazon is is uh, they're, they're obviously big. They've got almost fifty thousand workers there, uh, but that city, from a you know, that's a city of two million jobs versus you know, three, three and a half million jobs. So the context is very different. Um, I think you know, as far as our our team staying grounded and keeping their kind of feet on the ground and not you know getting ahead of themselves, um, I haven't really seen. A lot of that, I haven't, you know, it, 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 it's a great question because you might accept, expect, you know, are, are people, you know, going to start 
you know, believing their own, you know, BS or, or whatever. Um, I think generally we've got a pretty grounded crew that knows, uh, you know, that there's a lot of luck in, in, in this. And, you know, we didn't make Amazon decide they wanted to go and get a second headquarters. We didn't create the wealth of tech talent in this market. Um, we, we got very lucky in terms of the timing. You know, we, we closed on the, on the Renato, Charles E. Smith, JBG merger only six or seven weeks before Amazon released this RFP. So we had no idea this thing was coming. And those factors are all just pure luck, just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, we, we, I mentioned we had our investor conference, uh, uh, in, in one in April and one in May. Um, and you know, the, the thing I said to our investors is that I, I like to think of us as being, as certainly as it relates to the, the most recent past, lucky and good. Um, you know, some people say I'd, I'd rather be lucky than good. I guess, I guess if you had to pick, um, but uh, I do think we're we've been both. There have been plenty of times we've not been lucky. Um, we always try to be good at what we do, and a big part of that is not letting our heads get big or somehow think. You know that that we are, uh, you know that we're we're special in any way that, that goes beyond just the fact that we have a lot of very good people who have a lot of talent and who are I, I think easy to work with. I, because I, I really think you know you get a lot of characters in real estate. You get a lot of um, personalities. You know who uh, you know whether it's you know the sort of the New York you know Trump caricature kind of real estate you know, tycoon or, you know, just the impossible to deal with curmudgeons or unreasonable people. Um, I do think that one of our differentiators is that we're a pretty flexible organization. That's one of the reasons why we were able to make the Amazon deal. You know, we, we did a lot of listening. We listened to what is it that they want and and how can we how can we give them what they want and still get what, what we need uh, as a counterparty to a deal. And not everybody approaches business that way. There, there's, there, there, I, I think of the real estate business as having people who see the world in win-lose terms and people who try to find the win-win. And there are a lot of people who look at deals as, as win-lose. And if I'm not the winner, then I'm the loser. And so it prevents them from making deals quite often because they don't want to be the loser. It also makes them difficult to make deals with because they're so insistent on being the winner. And you know the Amazon deal, I think, is a classic win-win, and that's generally how we try to approach things. Uh, but if you're full of yourself, it's really hard to end up in that kind of a in that kind of an outcome. And so um, it's not, but it's not something we have to actively tamp down. Um, I think a lot of people right now, you know, have, you know, they, they, it's sort of a white knuckle ride to make sure we we get it all done. There aren't any drop balls, no mistakes. Everyone's Kind of wide-eyed and focused, really trying to, you know, just execute uh, because it's still, you know, we're 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 at the, um, you know, the, the the beginning of the middle, you know. I mean, we're still really we the the, the end of the beginning uh, was just behind us, and we're still very early days in all of this, and we've got a ton of wood to chop, so we really can't afford to, you know, get distracted by our own success or anything silly like that, because that. You know, we also all know it doesn't last very long, and I think we also are all pretty aware that this is this is about our team and our organization. And you know, as soon as any one of us leaves the team, you know, we're just we're just people. You know, there's nothing there's nothing magic about it. It's about all of us working together and keeping our heads down. Ben Bridger, thank you very much. Let's